I've lost my, what do you call it? My thought process. <laughs> okay. okay, is it recording? Is it showing recording or no? It's not showing. Yeah, it is showing. Okay, okay. All right. So, yeah. So, what I was saying was that uh, I have, I started doing robotics uh, after doing many, many years of VATS. Uh, Medanta was the place where I started the uh, robotic thoracic surgery program. Uh, at Medanta, we bought uh, uh, SI system. Uh, uh, then we also bought the S system. And uh, then we bought a dual console SI system. So I had the pleasure of working on all of them. And uh, things seem to have worked in that situation. Uh, when I came to London uh, at St. Bartholomew's, St. Bartholomew's uh, in 2017 or 16, I think, uh, bought the XI system. So they bought two uh, robots uh, by using the Barge charity. Uh, one was the one was dedicated for thoracic surgery. So it's probably, I think, the only robot around the globe which is dedicated to thoracic surgery. And the other one uh, that they bought was for urology and all other uh, uh, specialties. Uh, and then I started working in SIFI. Uh, SIFI actually bought a second-hand robotic system from uh, Asian Heart. And so they have the SI system. And also now at uh, Wellington Hospital in London, uh, which is a private hospital, uh, we have the uh, XI system. So there are. Uh, so I have over the years had the opportunity to work with uh, almost all uh, uh, systems of robotics, and and trust me, they are a very different experience. Uh, the, the the platform has changed dramatically, and I still hope that the platform will continue to change dramatically for the future. And I'll talk you through it, and I will see how we can. Uh, uh, you know, how uh, how the various differences between the platforms are. Uh, so whenever I talk about thoracic surgery, whenever I go around the world and I discuss thoracic surgery in cardiothoracic meetings, I get repeatedly told that thoracic surgery is a poor man's disease, particularly in Asia. So when I first took a decision to come back to India in 2010, uh, everybody laughed at me. They said, there is no hope in hell. You're running a very successful VATS program uh, in the UK. Why would you go back to India? Because India is all tub tuberculosis and paima, this, that, that. And everybody laughed at me and said that there is no way that you will ever be able to start a robotic surgery, uh, a minimally invasive robotic surgery in India because thoracic surgery is a poor man's disease. Everything is all like this, you know, dirty, infected, pus, and stuff like that. And the cardiac surgeons would sit on their high horse and uh, would laugh at me. And they would say that we all do posh surgeries, clean surgeries, sternotomies. We don't want any infected cases in our ICUs, in our wards. And uh, this has been the domain, this has been the thought process over many, many years. Either way, these are my two children. Of course, they've grown up now. But these are my two children when... I took their picture many, many years. So this image has always survived of thoracic surgery. A thoracic surgery is 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 an old battered car, and and the cardiac is uh, you know all 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 uh, clean. But then uh, with the onset of minimally invasive surgery, and with the onset of uh, onset of uh, VATS, uniportal VATS, and robotics and uniportal robotics, the image is slowly changing. And because of this image, I think a lot more people are now getting enamored towards taking up thoracic surgery as a career. Uh, and, and I think technology has had a huge role to play in, in the change of the image. Uh, as I say this, I've said this many times in my lecture um, in the past, that whenever we talk about thoracic surgery, the image that comes up at the top of the mind is this large cut on the chest wall, uh, you know, cutting through muscles, cutting through uh, fat, and then spreading the ribs apart for four or five hours, and then getting into the chest and doing whatever surgery you want to do. Um, Sri Krishna and I have both trained through an era of thoracotomy and sternotomy, where these were the main tools of access to the chest. 
uh, 50, about 15 or 20 years ago, probably, I was fortunate enough to start working uh, with Khaled Emer. And uh, Khaled Emer and I had a different uh, thought process. Uh, we uh, started looking at the possibility of doing things uh, by minimally invasive. So when we started off, we, we did three cuts on the chest wall. Here is one cut for the camera, one cut for the posterior port, and one cut for the anterior port. And we found that putting in these three ports and putting in the camera, we were able to do almost 99% of surgeries that were possible by open thoracotomy. So gradually our experience increased and we stopped doing uh, open surgeries. Uh, there are some cases where of course open is still the choice. And even today I still maintain that the gold standard in thoracic surgery is still open surgery. But uh, majority of the patients don't need open surgery. You can do almost everything in the mediastinum, in the lung, uh, in the trachea, in the diaphragm by putting in a camera. The advantage of this was, of course, that you take away the uh, retractor and you take away the cutting of the muscles. Because when we make this incision, we do not cut the muscles. We actually split the muscles. And uh, you use a, 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 you know, a, a wound protector and that just spreads everything apart and you can get into the chest. So gradually with time uh, as surgeons, we moved on from three ports to two ports. Uh, uh, D'Amico spoke, uh, uh, was the first guy in the US who started talking about taking away the third port and putting in just two ports. And then Diego Gonzalez Ribas and uh, 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 Calvin Nag and Al uh, Alan Siho from Hong Kong, uh, they all took up the mantle of uniportal vats. In fact, Diego, uh, I think that era was 1998 when we all went on this uh, journey of uniportal vats. And my first paper in Uniportal VATS has been published in 1998, uh, a case series of 65 or 70 cases with Uniportal VATS. But um, come 2000, uh, 2000, 2001, we, we diverged in our pathways and Diego went down the Uniportal route and I went down the robotic route. And then when you go down the robotic route, it doesn't make sense uh, to, to do things Uniportal. You actually go multiportal using the robot as well. And then from there on, we pushed on to the robotic platform. So the robotic platform was really an amazing platform, which completely changed my life and completely changed my thought process over how to do these surgeries. And so today, I will take you through my journey of the robotic uh, platform. I'll try to share with you the experience of why I do robotic surgery and how I do robotics. These are the two questions which I will answer. So, but the important thing is I am not biased against any one of them. I think minimally invasive thoracic surgery should be treated as a, as a armamentarium of tools. You know, when you, your enemy is common, your enemy is the cancer which is there inside the chest in the lung. How you access the chest wall doesn't really matter. It completely depends upon your level of comfort in whatever technique you have. And you have the whole tool of techniques, including multi-port VATS, uniport VATS, robotic VATS. You know, robotics for me is just a tool. And I want to say this right at the start of the whole discussion. I do not want anybody to go away thinking that the robotic is the be all and end all of all surgery. What really matters is what you do inside the chest. And as long as you can do the whole operation successfully and follow all the oncological principles that are needed for doing the operation, then the access to the chest wall is not important. Hence, I still maintain that the gold standard with the most experience in the world is open surgery. And then use multiport, uniport or robotics as a tool to uh, improve your uh, outcomes for the patient. And that is the key message I want you to take it. I want you to take home. So it is horses for courses. Okay, you must very clearly define. Most importantly, what is the disease pathology in the patient? Number two, uh, how will you get radical clearance of that disease? And third, and most important thing, and it is the third thing, is what is your level of skills to choose the tool? So you know, if you put uniportal in my hand, that is not a good tool for me 
because my experience is with multiport and robotics that's why i i tell everybody on this program that don't get hooked on to one technique early in your training era you must go through all of them you must learn every single of one, one of them and then decide what is your zone which gives you maximum comfort and then you go down that route and do whatever surgery that you want to do so the question uh, that comes to all of us and we are asked many many times in hundreds of conferences by senior surgeons is why should i change i have been doing this for 30 years and i'm very happy with it and i'm getting great results and why should i change so the reality is what's wrong with this nothing wrong with this absolutely nothing wrong with this you can still have this in your house and you can call london paris new york tokyo there is nothing wrong with this but hand on your heart if you put your hand into your pocket you're going to come up with this okay so why did you change why did you adapt to technology the reason you adapted to technology is because technology made your life easier technology has shown that the outcomes in patients is better when you use certain minimally invasive tools it has shown that there is less pain it has shown that there is a better cosmesis it has shown that there is quicker uh, release discharge from hospital so a lot of things come into the picture once you start using technology and become familiar with and then you start realizing the advantages of technology so each one of us has to take our own decision as to what is the level of change that we are willing to accept in our clinical practice so let's look at why robotics okay what are the advantages of robotic surgery so the first and foremost thing with robotic surgery is the vision the vision because the main reason why minimally invasive surgery became so popular is because vision started to get better not that we got better as surgeons the technology got made the vision much more easier you can only do a good surgery if you can see well so with on the robotic platform you have the highest definition of vision okay very very crisp vision the second thing is the colors that are uh, used in the robotic platform are true colors okay and most important for me is every single uh, robotic operation can be saved or recorded in the highest definition possible in fact uh, the some of the systems that we were using for recording on the robotic platform were giving us an output of one file of 20 gigabyte i'm serious some of those uh, files which i have operated on eventually turned out to be a 20 gigabyte file for a 3 hour operation so that is the level of quality that you can get in the recording if you want to use it i would not advise you to have such a high level of uh, recording Uh, but uh, you know many of my files of robotic surgery are actually 18 gigabytes 20 gigabytes not because they were very long operations but they were very high definition uh, recordings and that really matters and i'll tell you later on why that matters particularly when i do my wax talk i'll tell you why recording is really important the second advantage of robotics is that it is not just one camera the robotics camera is truly a binocular camera okay which means that there is a separate camera for the right eye and a separate camera for the left eye and the two cameras are fused into each other and the image is being captured and transferred to the console where my right eye is getting one image and my left eye is getting another image and the two images are then fused in my brain to create a three dimensional vision and so the three dimensional vision that you get with robotics is a true three dimensional vision which means that the depth of perception of the robotic platform is highly highly accurate if a structure lies at 1.28 mm it truly lies at 1.28 mm when your brain perceives the depth of vision it is a very accurate depth of vision quite unlike the 3d movie that you see in a cinema when you see a 3d movie in a cinema and you see the t-rex coming towards you that is not truly coming towards you 
as opposed to that the robotic platform if a nerve or a vessel lies at 1.8 uh, millimeter that it truly lies so when your hand moves 1.8 millimeters the conversion of your hand movement to the instrument is highly highly accurate hence your surgery becomes very very accurate and very very precise and that's the most important thing about robotic surgery this technology of getting 3d vision is what makes robotics so wonderful I have used 3D cameras on uh, other systems. I've used it in VATS. I've used it in, uh, uh, you know, in, in smart ORs and everything. I've tried all the 3D systems that are available out here. I've used it in virtual reality screens as well. But in all of them, my experience has been that the one, uh, the vision that you get on the robotic platform is the most accurate depth of perception. And, and that is why I feel very comfortable uh, doing robotic surgery. It's the depth of vision is very accurate. The next advantage of robotic surgery is the true dexterity that you get with your uh, robotic camera. So whenever I am, uh, whenever I am using a, a robotic surgery, uh, whenever I'm using uh, a, a VATS platform uh, or, or I'm doing open surgery, my wrist, wrist is restricted by this movement. I can't go beyond this. My wrist is just can only flex this much, can only extend this much. The robotic uh, surgery, surgical instruments have an endo wrist, which has got nearly 360 degrees of rotation. So you can rotate the endo wrist 360 degrees around. And more importantly, it has additional seven degree freedom of movement. So check this movement. So this seven, uh, seven degree freedom of movement plus add the 360 degree of rotation gives you a phenomenal access to any structure so you can actually swing the robotic uh, instrument from below and look at a structure from below up and start operating with equal accuracy and that is the important thing to remember so it, it really this dexterity of the surgical instruments makes the technicality of the surgery much much more precise as compared to any other platform including open surgery so to get into difficult areas to get into tight spaces to get into narrow areas is is an absolute pleasure with robotics uh, particularly when you're operating in deep cavities that's why pelvic surgery works beautifully with the robotic platform because you st stand at a distance and you go right into the depths of the pelvis and your instrument can rotate around in that narrow space and you can get good uh, movement around very important structures. That is why the mediastinum is a beautiful uh, area for use of the robotics because in the mediastinum, you're around major uh, vessels, aorta, pulmonary artery, you name it. And then from there, you can swing into the neck and get into the base of the neck and dissect around major uh, neurovascular bundles and so robotic works very well in these areas where you're operating from a distance at a structure which is far away from you and the gamut of instruments available on the robotic platform are, are multiple so everything everything that you can think of now is there on the robotic platform the only problem is that every time you dock a new instrument the cost goes tangentially up because the problem is that the robotics uh, so far has been dominated by a single company. And what it has done is it has introduced a software in the system where they have locked the use of the instrument to 10 uses. So though the instrument may be good, but once the 10th use is docked into the arm, it locks away the instrument and you cannot reuse it for the 11th use. So uh, the cost of the surgery goes up because more number of instruments that you use, each instrument will add more cost to the operation. So for example, uh, one, uh, one of these instruments, if you buy, will cost uh, somewhere around uh, 1.8 lakhs, which is around 1,800 euros. Um, and then you have to divide it by 10 uses uh, over 10 patients. Uh, and, and so for every time that you dock in an instrument, it's about from 18,000 to 30,000 extra per instrument. 
So unfortunately, the company has, you know, put in the system of locking the instruments and that has added to cost of the robotics. If these instruments could be used for a longer time, maybe the cost may go down. Okay. The other big advantage of uh, robotic surgery is that uh, sitting on the console, you need very little assistance, very little assistance. Most of the times when I'm doing VADs, I can only, only control my right hand and my left hand. But when I'm sitting on the robot, I control four hands all at the same time. You can control each and every one of those procedures at the same time. And anybody who does VADs will know that the main limitation of doing a good quality VADs is your assistant. Because if your assistant doesn't know how to hold a camera, your life is hell. Your life is absolute hell with the camera. As compared to that, on the robotic platform, you control the camera. So you can move the camera forward, you can move the camera back, and it's a very stationary platform. So you are in control of what you want to see. And so you don't have to depend on an assistant. So that is the real key for robotic surgery, that you as a surgeon control everything at the, uh, of, the, of the equipment. But you still need a very good assistant at the table for two reasons. Number one is, of course, the assistant changes the instruments for you as you want. Or if you're doing a hybrid robotic assistant wax, then he will use a stapler through the port for you. So while you are doing a wax a robotic dissection, the assistant will be doing what is essentially a wax stapling of the blood vessels or the bronchus. Uh, if you are, if I'm uh, operating in London, then I will use my robotic staplers but in a country like india the cost of robotic staplers is too expensive hence we try to use the local laparoscopic uh, staplers so that's one and number two the reason why you need a very trained assistant at the bedside of the patient is because if something goes wrong or if you have a bleeding you do not have the time to change and come back into the operating theater because you are not scrubbed you're sitting on a console unscrubbed. So that is why you need a very trained guy at the table so that if something goes wrong, he takes control and he can just either open the chest or take over by that and apply pressure by the time you get up from there and you put on your gown and things like that. So don't think that the assistant is not important. Actually, the assistant is more important in robotics because you rely on the assistant to save the patient's life. But during the course of the operation, you don't need the assistant's help. So in my surgeries, most of the times, the assistant will be just sitting uh, on a stool and chatting with the nurse for most part of the surgery. So there are many, many instruments that are available on the robotic platform, and these numbers are increasing. Uh, and we also have specialized uh, pediatric uh, instruments, which are uh, smaller in size, uh, so they can go down to almost three millimeters at the tip. So there are various uh, instruments available for you. Uh, the robotic stapler is, is a fantastic tool which is designed only for the robot. You cannot use it anywhere else. And it's a curved tip stapler which can be, uh, which has the dexterity. Can you see that there is, a, there is an endo wrist and it has a dexterity at the, at the wrist which can move the stapler in any direction. And the firing is done by the console. So you control the console and you do what is called as a controlled firing. The assistant does not fire the stapler as uh, is done uh, in VATS. Uh, again, the uh, further extension of instruments on the robotic platform are the development of vessel sealants uh, and harmonics as well. So all of these technology, everything that is available on the VATS platform is now essentially available on the robotic platform. The only problem is uh, it is very expensive. Every single instrument that you use adds a great amount of cost to the operation. But of course it adds value to your operation. So continuing on with the advantages of robotic surgery, I think the one big advantage which I find is with dual console. And my juniors will vouch for this because with a dual console, I am 10 times more comfortable teaching a surgery to my junior most surgeon. Because if you look at the foot here, I also have the same controls as my assistant has. And so when he is operating, I can give 
the control of some instruments to him. He will start dissecting. He will start doing some things. And if I feel that he's making a wrong move or if I'm not comfortable with his skills, all I have to do is take over the control. And then I can navigate him through the difficult part and then give back the control. So this is like teaching somebody on a, on a car where the brakes and pedals are with both the driver and the instructor. And that is why I find teaching robotic surgery is 10 times easier for me than teaching, uh, than teaching uh, that. And uh, I mean, in my own uh, group, uh, I have had my first year resident actually doing uh, work on the robotic platform. And uh, I've had uh, young surgeons doing thymectomies with me on the robotic surgery platform. I mean, and it's, it really gives me great comfort to be able to teach. The other advantage of robotics is it makes me a better surgeon. I'll tell you why, because I've got di diathermy and dissection in both my hands. And many, many a times I have actually continued doing an operation left-handed. You cannot do that in rats and you cannot do that in open surgery. You cannot suture with your left hand and you cannot use diathermy around the aorta with your left hand. On the robotic platform, it is so accurate and so much you feel the control that I, I've in fact published a, a, a paper on this, a right-handed surgeon doing a left-handed media span and tumor resection. Because sometimes the tumors are so positioned that your right hand may get blocked just by retracting. You may not be able to swing your right hand around. So your left hand can come into play and you can do the whole surgery using your left hand. So the robotics platform has allowed me to become ambidextrous. And that is, is a huge advantage for me uh, when I'm doing surgeries, you know, particularly in the media side. Uh, the platform has an inherent uh, ability to filter all tremors. So no matter what you're doing on the, cons on the uh, console, if your hands are shaking or whatever, that tremor is filtered out through these arms. So when the instrument at the patient end moves, it is a tremorless movement. So if you've had a bad day, or if you've had a fight with your wife or whatever, or you're really fuming and your hands are shaking, then don't worry on the robotic platform, you can continue to operate smoothly. And the, at the patient end, it will be a tremor-free fine dissection. And so your surgical career can increase. Many a times you'll find that surgeons with time start to get a little tremor in the hands and things like that. And that may actually be negated by using the robotic platform. And that's a huge advantage for the surgeon. Uh, the one thing to remember always is wax is a mirror image. When we look up on the screen, on the wax, when I want the tip of my instrument to move down, my hand has to move up. So my brain has to learn that I have to operate in a mirror image. If I want the tip of my instrument to move left, my hand outside has to move right. When my hand moves right, the tip of the instrument moves left. And this is, takes a lot of time. This hand-eye coordination takes a lot of time. That is why VAX takes a longer training curve. As opposed to that, robotic is not intuitive. It is actually a mirror image. Uh, is no mirror image. So because there is no mirror image, when you want to move the tip of the instrument to the right, your hand moves to the right. So when you start operating on the robotic platform, it is exactly as if you are doing a open surgery. So robotics is more like open surgery. So a lot of people ask me, you know, I am an open surgeon. Can I jump to robotics straight away or should I learn that? The answer to that is, I, I am a true example of that, that when I started doing robotics, I was highly trained in wax. I was doing advanced levels of wax when I started doing robotics. So my problem was that my hand-eye coordination was to a mirror image. And so for me to do robotic surgery, I had to unlearn a lot of techniques and a lot of tactics. Whereas somebody who is doing open surgery, very quickly, can jump to robotic surgery without even learning that because robotics is intuitive, just like open surgery. In open surgery, you know, you want to move anything, you go to the right, you go to the left. 
same thing in robotics whereas in rats your training is different so you have to unlearn things so hence robotic has better hand eye coordination and so i feel and it's been shown multiple times as well that the learning curve for robotic surgery is shorter than the learning curve for rats that is the most important thing to remember the other advantage of the robotics as i told you earlier is its ability to reach distant areas so i can i i do my thymectomies on the right i can go across into the mediastinum i can open the left pleura and go across into the left side and dissect it on the phrenic i can start my thymectomy in the left side i can dissect everything i can go into the mediastinum go across into the right side and do that that ability is is just you know the further away your camera is the more you get control over the instruments and that's something you learn when you start doing a lot of robotics is that the further away you are the more safer it is to reach a distant area and and of course the fine dissection gives you safe dissection around vascular structures and particularly in the pelvis where the genital nerves are present robotics is second to none in preserving the genital uh, nerves and in preserving the uh, erectile uh, function uh, for the patient uh, in the in the chest is the phrenic nerve that you can really save well with robotics in the in the pelvis it is really the genital nerves uh, which uh, come into picture so robotics has great advantage there <coughs> the newer systems in robotics have the ability of actually uploading the ct scan images into the robotic system so doing what is called as image overlay guided surgery so you can actually recreate the anatomy one day before you can do a dummy surgery if you want and practice your surgery before you go on next day to do an actual surgery on the patient these all technologies are now coming into the picture with artificial intelligence and with the virtual reality surgery so these are all the new technologies that will actually make robotic even more exciting for uh, new patient new people to learn now of course anything that has advantages has disadvantages it would be foolish to say that there is no disadvantage of robotic surgery the first and foremost disadvantage is the initial higher cost it is extremely expensive to set up a robotic program i mean in 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 uh, in india now with the new robots uh, the cost of the robot can be anywhere between 12 to 20 crores depending upon what deal you do with the country uh, in the uk the cost could be anywhere between uh, 100 000, uh, 1 million to 2.5 million so we and bars did a deal for two robots with some uh, in the disposable etc etc for around 2 to 2.5 million uh, pounds so it's a very very expensive cost to to invest in a robotic platform and most importantly it's not just the initial cost there is a maintenance cost with the company every year we have a maintenance cost of over 100000 uh, pounds to keep the robot in in good condition and of course the cost of the disposables is very high uh when you start doing a robotic program the operative time goes up because it does take a lot of time for you to get used to the various technologies that are there within the system and robotics is not a one person game the increase operative time is because it's not just your comfort with the robot but it is also the comfort of your assistants is the comfort of the scrub nurse is the comfort of the circulatory nurse so the whole team has to train and it takes a long time when you start off doing uh, robotic surgery i mean a uh, straight forward lobectomy if you open and close you would do it in one and a half hours and when you start uh, your first robotic surgery lobectomy you might end up doing anywhere between 4 to 5 hours so it does have early increase operative time and it does take time initially when we started the program for us to even dock the robot took us 45 minutes to 50 minutes and that is the time it takes for you to get used to the whole system but now our docking times are down to 1 minute or 1 minute 30 seconds so it it really changes with the learning curve so there is a definitive learning curve uh, the ability to pull and push uh, vital structures in the mediastinum uh, you know it's a different kind of feel you cannot uh, explain it till you do it that uh, when you're not sitting next to the patient and you are on a console that sensation of how much pressure to give how much to pull how much to uh, 
how much to uh, push is, is, is a difficult concept and it takes time to learn. And most important for me, the biggest disadvantage, which I just said, is the loss of tactile feedback. Even when we do wax, we are still next to the patient and we can feel the tissue. We can feel the dissecting planes. And, and that really matters when you're doing surgery. But when you come onto the robotic platform, the tactile feedback is completely lost. And so you have to develop a sense of feel when you're doing robotic surgery, when you're dissecting. You have to, you do not get the sense of this is a hard structure, this is a soft structure, this is a delicate structure. So it's very important to be careful about that. Now on the robotic platform, they've come up with a new software, which actually gives you haptic feedback. So there is a feel of, pull and push. So this takes away some of the disadvantage of the loss of tactile feed, feedback, but still it's not the same as open or wax. And that is why, uh, you know, it does take time to get used to doing robotic surgery. Uh, the other big disadvantage of robotic surgery is you need a competent surgeon at the OR. If things go wrong, then you really need somebody to be there at the table to open the chest. And many, many times I have canceled my case if my colleague or if my assistant is not there uh, or he's on leave. I have not scheduled a robotic case. I will never schedule a robotic case with a new assistant. I need my same team. I need the same scrub nurses. So the team uh, is very specialized for robotic surgery. And so you need to have all of them available in theater whenever you do a robotic case. And the other most important thing is urgent conversion. If there's bleeding, if there's tension pneumothorax, you really need uh, to be able to convert into an open surgery. And so this practice, we do every uh, few months in, in, in the UK or anywhere in the world, we are supposed to actually practice the drill of undocking a robot. It is a different technique and everybody needs to be certified in the technique of undocking a robot in an emergency. And you can undock in less than a few seconds if everybody knows what to do. Uh, if you don't undock the robot properly, you will end up with a dead patient. And so it's a very, very, very important uh, skill that anybody who does uh, robotics, docking is okay, but undocking is the most important thing because whenever you're doing an urgent undocking, it means you're doing it to save life. And unfortunately, a bleed in the chest can bleed five liters a minute. So you don't have much time uh, to get the robot out of the way because it's very cumbersome. It goes around the patient. So access to the patient becomes difficult when the robot is there. So in an emergency, you really need to learn how to undock a robot. And that is most important. Now, in the third world, uh, everybody asks me this question. How the hell can we start robotic surgery? How the hell do we make it cost effective? Is it possible? So the key to robotic surgery is volume. Whenever you buy a robot in any program, in any hospital, the one thing that you have to focus on is volume. And the way to focus on volume is to drive the robot hard. Now, the one reason why all the airlines in this COVID-19 era are becoming bankrupt is because their planes are sitting at airports. If planes are sitting at airport and they are not flying, they are loss makers. You cannot, you cannot run a business where planes sit on the airport. The same thing runs with a robot. If you have bought a robot, you have to run the robot hard. You must increase the volume through the robot. So at Medanta, we have a Monday to Saturday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. philosophy. You know, you post a patient for robotic surgery, no matter what time, we will get the theater. So the theaters are run to capacity by making it multi-speciality. The key thing is multi-speciality because if you get urology, gynecology, ENT, and thoracic together, that is the time when you can actually run a robotic platform 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., particularly in the corporate setup. So it's very, very, very important to run the whole program as a multi-speciality. In, in, in parts, it's, it's a real, it, because it's an NHS system, it's a different thing. There is less pressure on you in terms of the uh, accounting and costing. But even now, the pressure is there on them to run the volume. You have to do a lot of volume to keep a robot cost effective. Uh, and of course, if you're a big hospital and you have a good buying power and you have more numbers, then you can push the company for corporate and hospital subsidies. 
So we, we run, uh, whenever we buy robots and all, uh, we run a lot of uh, bargaining and negotiations to push for subsidies. In fact, if you look in one of my degrees uh, of education, I did an MBA uh, over, over three years. And the reason why I did an MBA was to actually understand the, when I moved into the corporate world and I, I started dealing with managers and things like that, I understood that you have to talk the same language as the managers talk. So today, they cannot bullshit me with uh, stupid graphs and, uh, you know, with uh, some ratios and this and that, because I know the language of business and I can talk with them. So you really need to be, if you are a program director of a robotic program, you also have to become like a business leader for that program. And you have to understand how to get corporate subsidies, how to run the business of running a robotic program. And doctors, unfortunately, very few of them know how to do this. The other way is you can buy refurbished robots. So a lot of uh, institutes around the world are now buying the XI system. And because they're buying an XI system, uh, the company does a program of buyback. So if you have an SI system, which was the previous system, the company will buy back the SI and give you the XI at a subsidized price. And then the company will sell the SI to other smaller units around the world or around the, com around the country. And so the cost of the initial cost of buying the robot goes down quite dramatically. So there are a lot of centers in India who have bought refurbished robots, either from India or from other places. And, and they are they are doing equally good job. There's nothing wrong with using an SI system. Uh, I mean, the classic example is Saifi Hospital, where uh, Kamran Khan and uh, Imran Hamzawala have run the program so beautifully with the refurbished robot that they have done over five, 600 cases in the first uh, year or two and really made the program extremely successful. Uh, of course, you can look for donors who will donate towards buying the cost. Uh, the important thing is for robotic program is the speciality. The manpower has to be dedicated multi-speciality manpower. So the same nurse can do a urology case and the same nurse can do a thoracic case. So we, we train the nurses in such a way that they become multi-speciality trained and that reduces the cost of manpower. And of course, you have to run the low cost maintenance deals with the company. Uh, in India, particularly, I don't use the fourth arm of the robot because uh, the fourth arm is usually used for retraction or pulling. And I don't need a robotic instrument to retract. I have an assistant at the table who is sitting there doing nothing. So I usually get Nikhil or Bhushan to retract uh, for me. So I don't use the fourth arm. So I reduce the cost of the, of the operation. Uh, I suture a lot with robotics as in open surgery. So when you suture a lot, small vessels and things, you can tie off as you do in open surgery. So you reduce the cost of staplers. So you keep the staplers only for the major vessels and the smaller ones and smaller structures you do with suturing and that directly reduces the cost of the operation for you. And uh, I, I take out all my specimens in, uh, in the third world countries where I work. I take out all my specimens in local urine bag. I, I take a urine bag, I just cut it across, fold it over at the rim, and I just put a purse string at the rim and push the urine bag in and put the specimen in. That way you save money on small, small things and it all adds up when the final uh, picture is, is put to you. So, these are the techniques that you use to make robotic car cost effective. I also drive an ERAS program very strongly. The moment I am on the minimally invasive program, I want my patients to get admitted, not the day before. I want my patients to get admitted on the morning of the surgery. So one day's admission is gone. I want, I give them pre-operative, post-operative yoga, physiotherapy, everything. Get them really fit. I use topaz suction drains in almost all my patients and I push for an early drain removal. So next morning on my ward round, I want the drain to come out if there is no air leak and the uh, chest X-ray shows adequate lung expansion. So the ERAs combined with a robotic platform makes it more cost effective for the hospital. I reduce all my disposables as much as possible. Uh, I will use the theater times very, very efficiently. I try not to use necklines. 
uh, no urinary catheters unless the patient has had any other morbid conditions. But in all patients, as a routine, we don't use urinary catheters. Uh, most of the patients are extubated. In fact, 99.9% .9 of the patients are extubated on table and we do not take them to ICU. So we just put them in a recovery room for four hours. And once they are fit enough, we send them back up to the ward. And we take great care of pain control. So we start very early uh, transdermal patches and things so that they are not on intravenous analgesics. So we push very aggressively with all of these. So it's a combined technique which actually helps you to reduce the patient's post-operative stay. And if there is air leak, I will quickly convert it into a flutter valve. In day two or so, I will convert into a flutter valve and that way the patient is mobilized and he will go and get discharged. Uh, and and in, at Medanta, we have local, hospital, local hotels around which actually serve as a hospital service. So patient doesn't need to be in hospital for a flutter bag. You know, he can go to his hotel room and sit there. And the hospital is a very expensive hotel because every day it costs the patient 10,000, 15,000 rupees. Whereas uh, a local hotel will cost you 1,000, 1,500 rupees. So you really don't need the patient in hospital. So we drive the whole program hard. And the way we do it is we understand what is called as day zero bed usage, okay? With the robotic program, it's very important to understand day zero bed usage. And what does that mean? That means you use minimally invasive, you use ERAS, you do early discharge, and then you reuse the bed for another surgery. The hospital makes the most income when a patient is operated on day zero. There is most expense and most income on day zero. So when you manage to reuse the same bed, you've got limited beds for your specialty. If one patient is lying on that bed for eight days, that's no good to the hospital. You're losing income the moment the patient lies beyond two days on that bed. So we do an ERAS, we get the patient up and about, we mobilize the patient, and get him discharged so that another patient can be admitted. So in that way, we increased our day zero from 106 days to 128 days. So that many new cases were, were, could be done because of minimally invasive surgery. And so we showed directly to the management that we are able to do more cases of surgery because we are doing minimally invasive. And also because the word goes out that you are doing minimally invasive, robotics or VADs, the reference start to come in, start to come in, and more importantly, the cross reference from other specialty in your hospital start to come in. So your numbers go on, go up. And the moment your numbers go up, that is when you tell the management, I want to buy a second robot. I can show you that I'm making more money for the hospital by a robotic program. And so and, the, and so on and so forth. And then you buy a third robot. Uh, we don't charge extra for uh, doing it by robotics. The main extra cost for robotics is the cost of disposables, okay? So we try to keep the surgeon fee more or less the same uh, as we do it by VATS or by robotics. So patients can afford the whole thing. But of course, you can also, it is within your ability to work the fee according to the paying capacity of the patient. So some patients may be very poor and you offset the cost. And some patients may be very rich and they can afford your extra cost. So that way you allow the hospital and the staff to have a leeway to make it affordable for patients. And there's a lot of papers out there which have looked at cost of robotic surgery. And one of the best papers is Raja Flores and Bernard Parks, which have published uh, a comparison of robotic versus VATS versus thoracotomy. And the real uh, outcome of all of these studies is as follows. Uh, sorry, uh, let me just go back to this slide. I'll come to the outcome of the studies in a minute. So the cost is because they're a single supplier. There is high capital cost. There's a maintenance cost and disposables are very expensive. So the real outcome, what we found in these papers is that when you compare minimally invasive to thoracotomy, the hospital state dramatically goes down with the robotics. The ICU stay with robotics or VATS dramatically goes down as compared to thoracotomy. The need for a high dependency unit. HDU is a system in the UK where instead of sending patient directly to the ward, you can downstage from ICU to HDU 
to the ward. So need for HDU, high dependency unit, goes down. There is earlier removal of chest drain in the minimally invasive group. And there is less use of logistics in the minimally invasive group. Uh, the factors that were not considered in the analysis of these papers was faster recovery, earlier return to work, the less post-operative complications that are there in these patients, the less need for district nurses to visit these patients, and the less need for rehabilitation. All of these are benefits of robotics and VATS over open surgery. Uh, so the final analysis showed that VATS was cheaper than open thoracotomy. The second outcome was that VATS is cheaper than robotics, of course, because robotic disposable is more expensive. But the most important outcome of this was the third outcome, which said robotics is cheaper than open surgery. And this is the key message that you've got to get it across, that robotics actually in the overall analysis of cost factors shows that robotics turns out to be cheaper than open thoracotomy if you take all elements of hospital econom economics into play. There is, of course, the added element of litigation cost with robotics, which you have to keep into mind whenever you start a robotic program, because it is a new program. There are cases, there are issues with uh, malfunctioning of the robot or harm to the patient because of the robot. So you all, any institution which starts a robotic program has to keep these, uh, uh, this sort of uh, issue, uh, the litigation cost into the picture, okay? So is it clear so far? Before I get into the clinical side of things, I've got into the management side of things. Is it, is it okay? Everybody all right? Or board shit or what hello no answer anybody wants to respond can you hear me or you can't hear me it is okay sir yeah what do you can you hear? yes sir yes sir Zami, do you have a standard operating system for undocking okay. yeah, yeah 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 i do i do i do i have so are you, are you going to be are you going to be discussing that or uh, yeah i can I, I can discuss it it's a, I, I, I have a standard undocking protocol i have not put it in this slide but i i can share it with everybody i do have a pla i have an undocking platform it is a legal requirement actually in the uk it's a legal requirement for undocking the robot you have to have a standard operating protocol so we have an sop for undocking uh, I, I i can put it in the slides if you want Okay, so let's now get on to the clinical side of things. I started with all this management side because it is important to understand why you do robot and how to make a robot cost effective. Now let's uh, look at the clinical side and see how we can work. So the anesthetist is extremely important in the robotic program and you cannot, cannot, cannot do it without your regular anesthetist. Very, 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 very important, okay? So in my robotic theater, I will always have two anesthetists. For the simple reason that whenever I am operating on the chest, the robot comes in from the head end. So because the robot comes in from the head end, the anesthetic equipment cannot be at the head end. So all the anesthetic equipment is moved to the foot end of the patient. So you need to have extra long ventilator tubings, extra long lines, everything has to go to the foot end. So in my robotic theater, always I will have two anesthetists because one anesthetist will be at the foot end and the second anesthetist who's usually the senior anesthetist will come around if anything's going wrong with the tube or needs uh, manipulation or adjustment. So I will always make sure that there are two anesthetists, two qualified anesthetists in theater. The second important thing is I will always make sure that the surgeon is present in the OT prior to induction. So right at the start of the uh, operation, you have to decide how am I going to get the robot in? How am I going to position the patient? Where is the trolley going to be? All of this is discussed. But now, of course, it has become second nature to us because everybody knows what to do. But when you start a program, it is extremely important that you have to be there in theater for um, even before induction to direct 
the whole thing. You are like the like the director of a big movie set, and you have to arrange the whole set in such a way that everybody understands what you are doing. So this is how we normally talk. So this is how we normally talk the robotics. Uh, I am standing at the back of the patient. Uh, can you guys hear my voice now? Yes. So when you're docking a robot, you bring it in from the back. The spine of the robot is the most important thing, and the spine of the robot must be parallel to the to the uh, to the camera. And then you open it up wide. It is absolutely important to open the arms wide so that you prevent a clashing of the arms. This is with the SI system. So you open it up wide and then you get it in and each one of these gets locked onto the port. The ports are special ports which have sensors on it. So these ports have a sensor on it. You have to lock it onto this. They will not lock until and unless the alignment is straight. If the alignment is not straight, the port will not lock. And so it's very, very important that the alignment has to be done. So this was uh, three years or four years ago that I did this video. And my docking time had gone down from 45 minutes to 2 minutes 42 seconds. Now my docking time is down to 1 minute 30 seconds. So you can really, with practice and with the whole team getting along, you can dock the patient very well. The XI system is a different system. The XI system uses a different protocol when it is docking. It uses a, a laser beam. So this is, watch this video. On the thing you can choose, whether it's thoracic or cardiac or pelvic, moment you press it, the system recognizes where you have to go, and then you roll in the, uh, the, the machine. So Automatically, the pivots will raise and uh, get into position. Here are the pivots uh, rotating. This is an XI system, not an S, uh, SI system. So the, the arms are getting engaged. Watch the arms getting engaged. And the moment the arms are getting, have been engaged, then you're ready to dock. And then you start moving the uh, docking into the... So it's called as deployment of the boom. Once the boom is deployed, then you drive the cart. There is the cart being driven in. Uh, and a sterile member is actually directing the non-sterile member. Uh, and and we, we say, uh, you know, the room orientation is what is used. And now watch this, this cross mark. This cross mark is a laser beam. And the laser beam is targeting. So you bring the laser beam in onto the patient. Watch the green laser beam coming in. You get the green laser beam in, and once the green laser beam is in, you target it onto the anatomy where you're going to operate. So you have to tell the machine that I am going to do the pelvis or I'm going to do the, uh, I'm going to do the thymus or whatever. So once you've done that, uh, then you, you, you dock the machine in and it just clicks in. Uh, and then each of these arms are docked in. Uh, the good thing about the XI system is that the camera can go into any of these arms. In the SI system, the camera has to be in the middle and the two instruments have to be on the two sides. As opposed to that, the XI system, the camera can come in any of these arms. So you can change the camera around to get a view from the right, to get a view from the left. And the whole technology is so distinct that the arms can come closer together. They are slimmer arms. So the arms can come closer together. And hence, the clashing of the, of the XI system is much less than an SI system. The SI system, you have to put the ports as far away from each other as possible. A minimum of nine centimeters between the two, uh, two ports. In the XI, you don't have to worry about that. In the XI, the ports, the distance between the ports can reduce down to seven centimeters. And so that is a huge advantage of an XI. It definitely gives you a much more, uh, <clears throat> much more closer docking and uh, a much more stable docking. So here is the camera being docked onto it. And then uh, you dock the arms according to the needs of the thing. 
So once the camera is in, you do what is called as targeting. So you press a clutch button here and the camera is going in. And then uh, once you have done that, you stabilize the patient's body wall and you do uh, the targeting. And the targeting, you have decided if this is a, this is a uh, timers that you're operating, then the whole boom is moving to target that uh, instrument or to target that organ. So it has an ability of 360 degree movement on the boom to target. So the same setting can zoom around and target the chest. The same setting can turn around and target the pelvis. And that is a big advantage of the XI system. So it's a completely different uh, targeting system. This boom at this top swings 360 degrees and that is what makes it more accurate in targeting. Uh, I promise you when you start doing robotic, robotic surgery, the most difficult part is docking. Uh, once you learn to do the accurate docking, then the whole surgery becomes a piece of cake. It's the docking that needs to be learned. And uh, if you use an XI system, the docking is much easier than an SI system. Once you've done that, then you go and sit on the console you press the button. It has a preset memory for my last position. It, like a Mercedes-Benz uh, car seat, I can press a button and the whole machine will move up and down to my level of comfort to make sure that I am able, I am at the right height. I've got these two things on, uh, I've got foot pedals on the right, which are diathermy. I've got foot pedals on the left, which are, uh, uh, clutch, uh, which can help me get the fourth arm. Here is the 3D vision. So this is the right eye, this is the left eye, separate vision. And then my brain will fuse it to form a thing. I'm sitting there comfortably, my hand is rested, really relaxed. And then you do what is called as a pincer grip. So the pincer grip gives you control over the instrument. And then just by rotating clockwise or anti-clockwise, and moving the hand forward and backward, you can actually rep replicate your whole movement on the robotic platform. And that's the beauty of this search. Okay. Did you guys understand docking? Hello? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is the way you dock the robotic platform. Okay. Now, how do you start a robotic program? You always start a robotic program by small fish. Okay, always look for the small fish in the town. Okay, look for the really easy ones. And the easy ones in town are small posterior mediastinal tubers, uh, a mediastinal cyst, a pericardial cyst, or a sympathectomy. To be honest, in my opinion, a sympathectomy is definitely an overkill with a robot. I do not. Uh, really recommend it to a patient. But if somebody insists, then that's a different issue. But uh, it's an easy surgery in terms of learning how to uh, run the robot. Uh, then once you're comfortable with the console, once you're comfortable with how to use uh, the various uh, the settings of the robotic program, then you move up to the next level. And the next level is the intermediate fish. For me, is thymectomy for myasthenia gravis. This is actually an easy operation which can be learned very, very well uh, with the robot. And the robot comes into its own when you're doing thymectomy. I really think it's a beautiful operation. Then you can do a small thymoma uh, and, and, and a suturing with the robot is another magnificent tool. The ability to suture with the robot is just like doing it by open surgery. It's almost as if you're sitting in the chest and you're lifting the structure and putting a suture. So your hand movement is just like this. And tying a knot is, is you just replicate the knot tying movement of open surgery and the robot does it for you. So uh, in, in VATS, suturing is very difficult, technically very challenging. You need to practice a lot for that mirror image to become good at suturing with VATS. And unfortunately, as thoracic surgeons, we don't do enough suturing uh, on the bronchus or on the uh, pulmonary artery, as opposed to the laparoscopic surgeons who suture the bowels all the time. So it is very important. The robot gives you great ability to suture. Hence, for me, eventration of the diaphragm is a beautiful surgery to do by robot 
because it allows you to take nice bites of the diaphragm and allows you to tie down the diaphragm and pull the diaphragm down with a perfect knot in place. So it's really, really important that we learn uh, the intermediate operations before we get on to higher operations and try to get the big fish in the market. And the big fish in the market, in my opinion, is lobectomy for lung cancer. It's not an easy operation by a robot, and you really need to know what you're doing before you jump into trying to do a lobectomy uh, for uh, lung cancer. The other thing is, of course, lobectomy for tuberculosis and aspergilloma. I have a lot of experience now in a big collection of uh, TB surgery for, uh, by the robot. Uh, and, and it really adds value. The robot, in my opinion, adds great value. When the more complex the surgery, more is the value of using a robot. Uh, resection of large mediastinal cyst in tumors, uh, tumors with spinal extension and trying to do uh, spinal surgery in addition to robotic lobectomies. Uh, thoracic outlet is just an absolutely beautiful indication for using the robot because the, ro the ability of the robot to lean over the tumor and to dissect the tumor off subclavian artery, subclavian vein, and the brachial plexus is second to none. The, the, the flexibility of the instruments, of the robotic instruments at the thoracic outlet is just amazing. That does not give you the same uh, access to the thoracic outlet. Because remember, the VAX instruments are straight. And when you come at the thoracic outlet, you cannot see beyond the, the top of that uh, tumor at the thoracic outlet. Whereas the robot can go forward, lean over, and look at the top. And so everything can be dissected under vision and you can bring the whole tumor down very safely. Uh, I think sleeve lobectomy is a beautiful example for uh, robotic search because again, the ability to suture with the robot is extremely fantastic. So a sleeve lobectomy, a sleeve resection, or the esophagus. Esophagus is just uh, phenomenal, phenomenal. To dissect an esophagus with a robot is beautiful. And there's enough evidence now which is showing that uh, the lymph node dissection with, uh, in esophageal cancer with the robot is much higher than that uh, laparoscopic esophagectomy and even by open esophagectomy. So there is uh, the Chinese and the Japanese have published multiple series. Uh, I was recently in some uh, meeting and I heard these guys talking about uh, 400 cases of esophageal, sleeve res uh, esophageal resections with lymph node dissection and a comparison of open versus uh, robotic. And they found that the N, the number of lymph nodes that they could get out with the robot was much, much higher. Uh, pneumonectomies, I, I do my pneumonectomies using the robot, particularly for destroyed lungs. I find the robot is very, very good to dissect all the adhesions of the chest wall, to dissect it off the diaphragm and to dissect these adhesions of the thoracic outlet. That is where the most problem happens uh, when you're doing a pneumonectomy. Uh, segmentectomy is an excellent surgery and we are doing a lot of it actually. At parts, these guys are doing phenomenal amount of segmentectomy. And now the robot has been used for further indications like chest wall tumors and other surgeries. So having just given you a brief outlay of what is possible, let's get into the surgeries and see what is possible. Uh, so thymic surgeries, anything and everything on the thymus can be operated by the robot. Something like this, a simple straightforward or a four or five centimeter thymoma is excellent for taking out by uh, robotic surgery. The larger size thymomas, you can do the dissection with the robotic, but worry about the capsule, breaching the capsule, and also worry about how to get the specimen out. So all of us, all of us have done, you know, tumors which are... Uh, 8 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 12 centimeters. But really the risk of these tumors is being taken by the patient because if you rupture the capsule, you're making a stage one into a stage four. So you've got to be very careful in making a decision about uh, doing a large tumor by robotics versus open. Uh, the more uh, older I'm getting, the wiser I'm getting, the less I'm inclined to use uh, these tools for larger tumors. Uh, I, I think safety of the patient is the most important thing. When I was uh, younger and when I was more aggressive, I would really push hard to do everything by VATS and uh, 
robotics. But now I'm getting a bit more uh, cautious about uh, large tumors and whether I should really do it by robotics because I am not doing the patient any favors if I'm going to cause him recurrence in 15 years time. So very important to get the philosophy right. You should not compromise the surgical principles for access. Access is not the important thing. The surgical principle is the most important thing. So if you've got a tumor like this, don't even think about it, okay? Just go ahead and do an open surgery and take out the tumor safely. Uh, the key thing is you don't want to spill the tumor into the chest. Uh, I personally uh, do my robotic thymosis from the right side. I have also done it from the left side. There are people who are fanatical about the left-sided approach. Uh, they, they jump up and down all over the podium trying to talk about left-sided approach. Uh, it doesn't matter. Whatever is your level of comfort, whatever is your level of uh, thing, as long as you can safely take out everything by uh, the platform, it doesn't matter. I go with the right side because I find there's a lot of space and manipulation is easier. And for younger people, it's easier to go from the right side. But there are proponents who talk about the left side and it's okay. It doesn't really matter. You can go bilaterally as well. And now I go sometimes sub z -foid. So I go sub z -foid and I access the thymus from the right, from the left and dissect it off of the phrenic nerve from either side. I always use carbon dioxide in my robotic surgery because carbon dioxide dissects ahead of me. So whenever I infuse the carbon dioxide, as I'm going in with the robot, one, the camera uh, is always clean, so there is no fogging of the camera. And the second thing is, as I'm dissecting, the, the CO2 is moving ahead of me and dissecting the plane down for me to open up the... Uh, the people who go from the left side do not open the right pleura. I personally like to open both pleuras widely when I'm doing my uh, robotic uh, uh, thymectomies. I want to see the phrenic nerve on both sides. I want to lean over and see the left side and the right side. And my dissection is always complete phrenic to phrenic, completely clear away all of the prepericardial fat and most importantly, clear away everything in the neck and also the iotopulmonary window. So I will aggressively go into that area and clear away all of these uh, iotopulmonary windows. Uh, that's my standard position for thymectomies. Though in the UK, I have a sandbag. And because I have a sandbag, I can move this hand down here. And uh, so this, if you put your hand out here, sometimes the shoulder comes in the, uh, in the way of one of the arms. So uh, in, in Medanta, I, I never had the sandbag, so we couldn't push it down. But in the UK, because we use sandbags, you can very easily push it down here. And uh, the arm comes away, the shoulder goes down, and there is no clashing of the, uh, of the instruments. So this is how we do our, this is actually my uh, year one or year two resident doing a thymectomy. I specifically show this video because of the ease with which the dissection is taking place. Look at the way the resident is very, very neatly dissecting everything of the pericardium, uh, very nicely dissecting the left side, going all the way into the left phrenic, he's going into the neck. And, and remember, this is a year one or year two resident who's doing this surgery. So it, it is, it's a beautiful tool to teach a junior resident to do this. Here is the brachiocephalic. And you know, I'm suddenly feeling very comfortable. I clip the thymic vein. Uh, I don't use the robotic uh, clips because they are very expensive. Uh, in UK, I use the robotic clips. And then my resident is very safely delivering the horns in and he's pushing it all down and uh, nicely clearing the entire aorta, the entire brachiocephalic area. He is going to go, he's taken it off and then he goes in there into the aorta pulmonary window in a second and he will take out all the fat and fat from there and then swing it around into the near the diaphragm and take away all of the fat from the uh, pre-pericardial area. So once all this has come out, you will see that it's a completely clean uh, area. There is no fat, fat to be seen. That is the key thing. All fat should be removed. But of course, not at the cost of the phrenic nerve. So you've got to be very careful. And around the phrenic nerve, you should not use diathermy. And you should try and do as much blood. And this is the local urine bag, which I use as a specimen. And now the thing is going in there. I think this was Narendra doing the case. And uh, 
uh, an excellent operation done with everything removed, complete clearance. This is the aorta pulmonary window which has got out. It's got all the preperitoneal and got into the neck and done everything completely clearly for this patient. All my patients are extubated on table for thymectomy. The myasthenia uh, may be kept overnight in the ICU if I'm worried about myasthenia crisis. Uh, I never ever use epidural catheters, no epidural catheters. All chest drains are removed the next morning, absolutely mandatory. Admission in the morning, surgery scheduled for 2 p.m., topaz suction device, drain removed next morning, mandatory, and discharge the same day or the next day. So my average stay in robotics uh, thymectomy is about two days. So that, that is the important thing that you have to understand. Now, I want to just ask a question. Did everybody see the video or was it very staggered? Sorry. Did the video run smoothly or did it? Yes. It, uh, yes. Very smooth. Uh, it was good. It was. It was very. You smooth. could see the video. You could understand it well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Thanks, Sri Krishna. It's just I was worried that uh, the videos may not play very well. Okay. So, uh, as I told you, the robotics has to be added on with everything that's available at your disposal to make it uh, smooth for the patient. So in India, because I have a yoga teacher with me in my group, I use his techniques. He comes in pre-operatively, teaches my patients all of these techniques pre-op, and within three to four hours after they come out into the uh, post-op area, he will come back and quickly mobilize the patient and get him out of bed. And next morning, we have on the fifth floor of Medanta and Ayurveda garden. This is a strategically placed garden where my yoga therapist will take the patient out and get him walking around this garden. Uh, there are all these uh, smells and leaves. I don't understand any of this technology, but the patients come back and they feel good. They tell me that they are feeling good and that is why you feel confident to be able to discharge the patient. If a patient has long-term pain in any of the ports, then my integrative medicine specialist, this is Dr. Geeta Krishnan, and that, that is uh, Mr. Sharma. They, they do all these techniques, you know, of Ayurveda uh, for local pain relief. And um, people are getting fantastic results with these techniques. I don't genuinely understand the science behind it. But the moment you integrate with these local guys, it becomes an international seller. So we have published this extensively. And, you know, now Geeta Krishnan, because of his integrated medicine work, is now working in Geneva with WHO. And now the WHO has got involved and they are looking at using integrative medicine with uh, complex surgeries. So it is, it is, you have to use whatever is there at your resources. The one thing is to have an open mind. Keep your minds open. Use everybody's uh, knowledge for the benefit of the patient. And that has been my experience in India and it has really worked beautifully. Now, look at this cosmesis. In the old days, you would have made a big scar in the midline for this young girl, 20, 21 years old. And look at this. Here, one scar is in the axilla and two scars are in the breast line. When she, this thing goes off, she will never even see the scar once they heal. And once she wears a, a bra, all the scar lines are gone. So it's very, very, very uh, good technique to use once you start doing these surgeries. If you look at the literature and look at evidence-based uh, uh, recommendations, now robotic thymectomy, uh, now minimally invasive thymectomy is starting to come in the evidence. So, uh, you know, early, early thymomas, uh, stage one thymomas are now being recommended uh, to be operated by minimally invasive, either by VATS or robotics. Uh, of course, the higher grade thymomas, they still say you should do it by open surgery. The benefits of robotics in, in uh, versus VATS are quite a few. And we have spoken about it over the period of time. And now with Jens Rukard's paper coming out, uh, Jens Rukard has published a series of 300 plus thymectomies where he's compared uh, clinical uh, results. At the end of the day, what you want to prove is that the surgery that you're doing by robotics is just as good or better than open surgery. And so now Jens has shown a significant benefit in the uh, group with robotic surgery. They are getting better results with the robotic thymectomy as compared to open thymectomy. And not only that, they have got five, six years follow-up and they're looking at remission rates and they're looking at improvement and they have categorically proved that there is actual benefit 
to the patient by doing a robotic thymectomy, their symptoms do not regress uh, and they, they do not need recurrent surgeries. So this is an excellent paper by Jens Rucker, which has looked at all aspects of robotic thymectomy and concluded that actually robotic thymectomy is better than VAX thymectomy and open thymectomy in terms of outcomes for thoracic, uh, for uh, myasthenia gravis. So once you've done thymectomies in myasthenia, then other things, mediastinal tumors you come across, this was a large one which we took out. This is the one I was telling you, I took it out left-handed because it was very, a very, it was placed completely on the left side. My right hand became, couldn't go to the top. So using my left hand, I dissected the whole tumor out. This is about a 10 centimeter tumor. And surprise, surprise, eventually the histology came back as a carcinoid. So I, I don't know what the hell it was. In the thoracic outlet, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I told you the ability to dissect it of the brachial cephalic, uh, of this uh, brachial plexus, and of the subclavian artery and vein in the robotic platform is second to none. It's really a great tool in the thoracic outlet. And something like this, such a big, large tumor, see, but we actually went in by robotics and we managed to take the whole thing off from the top and all the way off here. And we didn't even need to do any lung resection in this patient. And, uh, you know, the outcomes were acceptable for the patient. Posterior mediastinal tumors are excellent. You, you really can dissect very nicely off, off this rib. And, uh, you know, something like this will come out. Uh, this was a large uh, 18 centimeter tumor, which was enveloping, uh, enveloping the aorta. So it was completely sort of two thirds uh, surrounding the aorta. And because we had the robotic platform, we actually did a sub-adventitial uh, dissection. So we actually lifted the tumor and lifted the adventitia of the robot. And because I was so confident about my vision and I was feeling so confident about my control of the tip of the diathermy that I could dissect the whole tumor off the aorta completely and then bring it out. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it worked well for the patient. Uh, parathyroid adenomas are increasingly being picked up. And uh, now I have a large series of robotic resection of parathyroid adenomas. Uh, all of them have preoperative CT scans, uh, 3D reconstructions, and spec scans, depending upon whatever institution you're working with. Uh, I personally give preoperative uh, IV methylene blue to these patients at the time of the induction. And once you give this IV methylene blue, it gets selectively picked up by the parathyroid adenoma. A problem is the parathyroid adenoma lies within the fat of the thymus many a times. And it's very difficult to identify where is this parathyroid adenoma. So once you've given methylene blue, look at this bluish uh, hush and the adenoma is clearly defined and you can very easily take it all off and do the whole surgery more safely. Of course, I do uh, the levels, parathyroid hormone levels and things like that. Uh, this particular case is, is a disaster which I want to share with you. Uh, while I was doing a robotic parathyroidectomy, the, the, the parathyroid adenoma was in the same area where station two lymph nodes, like a paratracheal area is there. And uh, here is the, the IVC, uh, sorry, the SVC and the azygous. And I am nicely dissecting. The whole surgery is going beautifully. Very happy with the dissection. Everything is going smoothly. I watched this video for what can go wrong. Uh, and very quickly, uh, a very controlled situation can become, uh, you know, completely uncontrolled. So I am taking it off the trachea. This adenoma was within this fat tissue. I knew it because I, I had seen it with a spec scan. And then, what I did not anticipate or should have anticipated is the feeding vessel for this adenoma. So I, everything is going smoothly. I've got the whole tumor out, pretty happy. Uh, in a second, you'll see it in a few minutes. I tried to keep some of the normal dissection there. So I'm taking the whole adenoma off. It's deep in the mediastinum now. And there I am taking the adenoma, all the fat in that area, retro SVC. So I've gone behind the SVC. And then I don't realize that actually the feeding vessel for this adenoma is coming from the subclavian artery, which is outside the chest, okay, outside the thoracic outlet. And I am dissecting, and then I get a little bit of ooze. Look at that little bit of ooze. And uh, 
I, I'm still in control. It's not as if I've lost control at this stage. And I grasped it and it seems to have stopped. And I was quite happy. And then I said, okay, just one last NIDA clip needed to be put. And the operation was going to be finished. And then the next thing I knew, the whole thing blew into my face. And I had like uh, liters and liters of blood in the chest. And, uh, you know, a, a relatively simple, straightforward operation ended up with a large thoracotomy and uh, packs and, uh, you know, repair of the, S of the subclavian artery. Complete disaster. Because what happens is when you lose the, uh, lose the feeding vessel, it retracts. And the moment it retracts, you cannot see it from the chest. And so the only way to do this is to then open the whole chest wide and get to beyond the uh, beyond, because this is retro SVC. So we had to then go in, sloop the SVC, lift it up, and then get into that area and put a vascular clamp and put suturing on. So I called in the cardiac surgeons and, and so we had to do an urgent undocking. We did a thoracotomy, we packed the whole area and we sutured that area. And uh, we lost almost a liter of blood. So that's the difference between robotics and VATS. When you're doing it by VATS, because you're physically there, you could, I could have just applied pressure and I could have got away with it. But the problem with the robot is there is A, it's all a closed system. There is no open area for a large swap to go in. And, uh, you know, I was unable to apply pressure with the robotics. And so that is something you have to really understand. And then, of course, you lose time in undocking and then getting in scrub and so we all lost almost a liter of blood in this patient and a simple straightforward operation got converted into a major major uh, uh, complication so it is something that you learn and and you do you you, you sort of live uh, so now we talk about robotic lung resection so what do what type of lung resections do we do using the robotic platform so i do robotic lobectomy for lung cancer I do a systematic mediastinal nodal dissection. I'm a follower of Kali Demer's philosophy. So I really aggressively dissect every single lymph node. Uh, again, I have a large series for robotic lobectomy for aspergilloma. This is the most complicated operation I, that you can come across. I personally feel that this, for me, is the most challenging one. And the robot adds the most benefit for these operations. Um, again, pneumonectomies metastatectomy for thymic cancer. So this is my position for a robotic lobectomy. I will break the table, always try to get the uh, intercostal space wide open, uh, always uh, a little booster, because this was a female patient, the hip was wide. So you put in a little booster here to lift up the chest so that your hips don't get in the way. I break the table like this, exactly as I would do for a VATS. My, uh, my thing is same. And then I will make these incisions, one, two, and three. These are my robotic incisions, and this is for my assistant. Always I'll make an extra incision for my assistant. So if I'm using four arms, then uh, this is it, camera port. This is my first arm, second arm, and third arm, if I'm using four arms. Or very often, I delete this third instrument arm, and I give my assistant an, an assistant port, which is, again, a triangulation in the two anterior ports. So this is my assistant port, and the assistant will usually get a 12 mm port. So he can put in staplers, he can put in uh, suction, he can put in Liger clips. So very often in India, I do away with this. Uh, in, in the UK, I use only these top four, and I don't use the assistant port. So it depends on horses for courses. You just choose what is available. So this is a robotic lobectomy in, in, in India, I think, where I'm using an assistant port. Uh, and and uh, I'll just talk you through inflammatory diseases and infective diseases. I think these are huge challenges. Uh, in India, we see all of these things. And in uh, addition to those problems, there is also this problem of nutritional de depletion, paucity of expertise, availability of uh, training, and things like that. So for me, when I do these operations for inflammatory disease, I strongly believe over the years now, uh, with many, many, many cases under my belt, my, uh, my uh, recommendations are that the view that you get with rats or with robotics is definitely 10 times better than open surgery. Because in open surgery, the illumination is not there. You know, you're always struggling to get the light in. 
Whereas with wax or with robotics, the view is 100 times better and it is magnified. So everything comes under view. Every single addition gets taken out under vision. So the blood loss actually is less with wax. In, robot, in open surgery, you swipe your hands around and you do open uh, dissection and there's a lot more bleeding. With wax or with robotics, we do not swipe. We burn every addition down. So every addition is dissected with energy. And so there is less bleeding than open surgery. And I definitely believe that the robot, robot is an excellent tool at the thoracic outlet. And that's my take on it. Uh, in aspergilloma, in uh, infected things, the ones that we've done are aspergillomas, bronchiectasis, lung abscess. I've even done a robotic and hydrated disease. And I've done pneumonectomies for destroyed lungs. Uh, infected bronchogenesis. Uh, LVRS surgery in emphysema post tuberculosis uh, patients, uh, post TB residual giant bullas, uh, pericardial window, uh, partial peri pericardiectomy, which is a phrenic to phrenic pericardiectomy using the robot, uh, cartagenous syndrome with uh, bronchiectasis, endobronchial inflammatory tumors uh, or inflammatory myoblastic uh, myeloproliferative tumors. Uh, any mediastinal lymph adenopathy with non-diagnosed uh, masses uh, and hydrated disease. So inflammatory disease uh, is, is a good indication. It's not a contraindication for minimally invasive surgery. That is the message I want to get across to you. From my series, uh, I think inflammatory disease is a good indication for robotic surgery. Whenever I do aspergilloma surgery, I personally like to start vericonazole preoperatively at least two weeks, and I like to continue them postoperatively for three months. We have discussed this in the past, whether you need to do it or not. I feel comfortable with it. My uh, pulmonologist feels comfortable with it. All the patients get medical optimization and usually try to complete HP if possible. The problem with the robotic, uh, with the aspergilloma is that you always have these uh, endobronchial uh, connections. And if you don't take care of the rest of the lung, and the rest of the lobes, you will have spillage. And that spillage will convert a localized uh, uh, aspergilloma into systemic fungal sepsis. So I've shown this before to you. Uh, my anesthetist usually in an aspergilloma does a lateral double lumen intubation. The patient's affected side is down. And once the affected side is down, then they will uh, put in a, uh, they'll put in a, uh, Fogarty catheter into the disease side. So the, a simple explanation for this is uh, if you're doing a right upper lobectomy, then the Fogarty catheter is in the right bronchus intermedius and uh, the double lumen tube is in the left side. So essentially you completely isolate the right upper lobe. So we, we aggressively follow these protocols when we are doing uh, robotic surgery because you have very little access. Uh, for the anesthetist to the top. So we want everything isolated completely. And then uh, we will always ensure that we check the Fogarty uh, with fiber order. So this is the arrangement that you need to see. So in a right upper lobectomy, the Fogarty will block the bronchus intermediates. And so everything is isolated, only the upper lobe is exposed. But when you put a stapler across, you must remember to pull back the Fogartys. Otherwise you'll accidentally staple the Fogarty. So be very, very careful when you do that. This is the video which I've shown before, I think. But I'll just show you how I do my aspergilloma surgeries. I just dissect enough to get into the chest. I don't dissect all the adhesions out. I leave the adhesions at the apex to pull the lobe, hold the lobe up. So the adhesions hold the lobe up and then I get into the hilum very quickly. My aim in robotic uh, inflammatory surgery is always to get into the hilum and uh, start isolating the various structures. Uh, and for me, the most important structure in all of this is the bronchus. I want to get the bronchus as soon as possible. There is no particular order of dissection because there is so much inflammation. You have to decide whatever you can see, you go in and you try and take it away. Again, see the beauty of the robot is it's allowing you to turn around and go behind the, behind the this is a bronchus going up towards the chest wall because of the adhesions. And the robot is allowing me to dissect behind the bronchus and that angle of the instrument is making it very easy for me to go across. I think this is being done in India. So my assistant is actually putting in the stapler 
and he is doing what is called as a mass lobectomy while I'm doing the robotic dissection. So he is at the patient's side. He is doing that. So we have got the structures that we need to get. I think the artery is the only one that is left. And I always use little sloops to, to go behind the artery because that gives me uh, control over the artery and allows me to use traction. And uh, so here we are now, we have got the arteries, we've got the vein, we've got the bulkus, and then all that is left is to take the dissection. But the dissection of the adhesions takes an extra two hours easily because uh, there's a lot of neovascularization, a lot of blood vessels coming from the chest wall. And see this, how clean the dissection is because we are actually buzzing every single vessel and you can use harmonic for this and you can very nicely take every blood vessel and descend the whole tumor out and take it out and deliver it out safely. So this, this for me is, is a very, very satisfying operation. And my personal choice is robotics in this. Again, something like this, a lot of people will say, you are crazy, why the hell, where can you get a camera into these uh, patients? But my experience has been completely the opposite. When you have something like this with severe dissect, uh, adhesion to the chest wall, I personally choose minimally invasive over open surgery because it gives me the difficulty is getting the first coat in. Once you get the first coat in, there's a technique to that. And once I get in with the first port, I will dissect as a uniportal and travel to the next port and make a second port and then travel to the third port. And once you've made the two or three ports and you've docked the arms, then all the dissection becomes very, very uh, clear because it's all done under vision. It may take a little more time, but it's beautiful, clean dissection. And surprisingly, in all of these, very often you'll find that the hilum is uh, spared. And if the hilum is spared, then it's all a matter of just putting your stapler across and stapling the uh, artery, vein, and bronchus and getting the whole tissue out through your small pores. Um, Again, we do sleeve resections and sleeve lobectomies, uh, particularly for uh, right main or left main bronchus. I'm a great fan of this. I will do a bronchotomy and transaction uh, when I am dealing with carcinoids. I remove the endobronchial tumor and I always send the margins for frozen section. And then we will do a bronchial anastomosis uh, using the robot and it's an excellent tool. So something like this, this is a, uh, this is a sleeve resection, and sometimes you do a sleeve lobectomy. So it depends on whatever is needed for the patient, you'll end up doing that. So here is a patient with an uh, inflammatory tumor in the left upper lobe, uh, but the tumor is coming all the way down into the left main bronchus. And this guy had been advised a pneumonectomy, uh, and I was not convinced that pneumonectomy is the right answer for this guy. Uh, so I told him that we will do this uh, by uh, robotics because the lower lobe looked fine to me. It looked as if the lower lobe was okay. The upper lobe had been destroyed. And so we went in by robotics. We found all these adhesions which we took down. Uh, again, see, the, every dissection is taken down on the vision. That's the message I want you to get. That there is no bleeding here. You know, you see everything under dissection. And every little bit you take down and you keep sucking as you go along. Of course, it's not, uh, you know, blood-free surgery, but everything, we can see things clearly. Here I'm taking the artery gradually. So I've not taken down all the adhesions. I've just opened up the fissure. And once I've opened up the fissure, I am taking the vessels as they come along. And I think this is in India. So we are using the laparoscopic staplers. We are nicely stapling everything out. and. Uh, you know, this guy was going to have a pneumonectomy uh, by open technique. And we, we said, no, let's see if we can try and save it. So here we are. I think this is the bronchus that we're taking. Uh, we're dissecting it all out. No, it's a lymph node, sorry. So it's, it's a calcified lymph node. So we've dissected the whole calcified lymph node off. And now the bronchus is free. We are clearing the bronchus to get a margin. So all the lymph nodes are being cleared out. My assistant is uh, taking the specimens. And then I'm going around uh, all these adhesions and stapling some of the vascular things. So I think this is the vein which I've taken probably. And uh, once everything is clear, now the vision is excellent. I'm very happy with what I can see. I can see the left main pulmonary artery. I'm taking all the small branches at the back because I'm trying to do a sleeve resection. I don't want to 
compromise the lower lobe. So I'm trying my best to save the lower lobe. And uh, here we are taking all the arteries to the upper lobe, dissecting it all out. All the dissection has been done. And remember, this is infective disease, okay? So this is all adhesions, serious adhesions all around. Even at the back, near the arch of the aorta, the bronchus is stuck to the arch of the aorta. But the vision is so good that you feel very comfortable to dissect at the back of the aorta, at the back of the bronchus. And now I'm going to make a cut on the bronchus uh, because I don't I want to get a clear margin uh, if possible and do only a lobectomy. So here I'm opening the bronchus, uh, again, protecting the inside. So, and the good thing is this instrument has got diapermy with it as well. So I've got a diapermy instrument with a scissor. So I can very nicely cut and buzz at the same time. And uh, here I can see the tumor. The tumor is completely prolapsing into the lower lobe as well. So it is actually occupying the upper main and the lower lobe bronchus. And because I know this is not a malignant tumor, I can ha happily take it out piecemeal. Uh, if this was a malignant tumor, then I would not do this. Uh, but because this, uh, we had a histology of an inflammatory tumor. So there is the tumor coming out. Uh, again, everything is under 10x magnification. So you, know, you are seeing this only as a two-dimensional view, but I am seeing it as a three-dimensional 10x magnification. So every little blood vessel I can see, every little uh, structure I can see, I'm nicely, uh, you know, uh, making sure that everything is okay. I'll pass in a flexible bronchoscope. I'll suck out the remaining lung to make sure that there is nothing there. And I'll complete my uh, bronchotomy uh, at the back. And uh, there is the whole specimen free. Now all I need is to take away the adhesions from the apex and deliver the specimen out. So now all I'm left with is this uh, little stump, uh, which is the upper lobe one, and then you take in the needle and you do suturing. And this is just like doing open surgery. I promise you, the, the beauty of suturing with the robot is second to none. And nowadays I've started using V-lock sutures. So V-lock sutures are, are sutures which uh, you don't even have to tie a knot, you just pull it through and they stay and you just put it through a lock and they lock itself. So you don't even have to tie a knot with the V-lock switches. That's the beauty of the switches. And so each one we're doing an interrupted uh, repair and we're making sure that the lower lobe bronchus is uh, clear. Nice deep bites going in, uh, you know, switches coming through smoothly. And again, see, this is like open surgery. This is how I would do it when I'm doing an open surgery. So I'm nicely placing the suture along here. Uh, and nowadays when I do uh, a pneumonectomy, not, not in sleeves, when I do a pneumonectomy, I actually take the whole phrenic down along with the uh, bronchovascular pedicle and I put the phrenic on the, on the bronchial stump. So that way I can cover the stump and also get the uh, elevation of the diaphragm. In this patient, of course, we are not going to do that because the lower lobe is still, uh, is still there. This is not a pneumonectomy. And so even though I'm next to the aorta and I'm in the aorta pulmonary window deep down, I'm able to suture. And then you just finish the surgery by taking down all the other adhesions uh, at the end of the operation. So you don't take down these things at the start. They help you. They give you a good uh, retraction. And then once you've done all of that, you just put it into a normal bag and take it out like an open surgery. So really, robotic is great when you're doing complex surgeries. I personally am a great fan of bronch uh, segmentectomies. Uh, I do unipolar, unisegmentectomies, bisegmentectomies, multiple segmentectomies. Uh, in in Bart's, we are doing a trial. Uh, my team, uh, my colleagues are actually using indocyanin green. Uh, so what they do is they inject the indocyanin green, and so the indocyanin green lights up the the normal uh, bronchus and tells you the the normal segments. So it tells you where exactly is your staple line. Uh, they're doing it uh, two, two techniques. One is intravenous endocyanin green, and the second one is endobronchial uh, endocyanin green. So they do a bronchoscopy and inject the ICG and let it light up. Uh, so it gives you a clear definition of the margins of the segment so that you can put your stapler across it. Uh, this is a segment technique. I, I don't need to show you each one of these in detail. So, so that's so much so for lung surgery. 
Now, I also like to use the robotic for other surgeries. So I have used it for chest wall tumor resection. I use it for plication of diaphragms. I have a, quite a big series of ligation of thoracic duct using the robot. And I've done some cases of robotic pleurectomy in a case with ligation of thoracic duct. So it's like a combined pleurectomy plus ligation. So let me share this case with you of a, of a patient with a second rib osteochondroma. Now this is a 16 year old guy who is just, um, who's just about to enter into Naval school for the Indian Navy. And as he's getting into the Naval school, he is, uh, sorry guys, can you see something has happened here? Wide screen only. Yeah, one minute, one minute. I just, Okay, let me just stop this and restart, stop sharing. Sorry about that, I, 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 it's me fiddling around actually. Is it making sense what I'm saying so far? Or is it getting to be too long? I don't know what's happening. Okay, stop sharing. It's just, I was fiddling with this. Okay, one minute, I'm going to just- Don't, don't ask leading questions. Mm -hmm. Don't ask leading questions. I, I can't hear you. What are you saying? I, I said just one minute. Let me just stop this and restart my PowerPoint. Okay. Sorry about that. This is my fault. I was I was playing around with the wires. And, uh, this one. Let me just restart the thing from where I left off. Because this is a very, very heavy presentation. It, uh, oh, shit, something has gone wrong. Okay, one second. Okay, can you see now? Hello? We can, we can, yeah, we can, we can see. Yeah, we can. Able to see. Are you able to see now? Okay. So uh, this is a 16 year old guy with a, uh, who went into the Naval school and uh, a routine medical showed this tumor on the second rib. The problem is to resect this tumor, you would have had to do a large thoracotomy, reflect up the whole scapula and then dissect out the second rib and take out this tumor. He wouldn't pass his medical. Uh, once you have a large thoracotomy on the chest wall, he wouldn't pass his medical. So what we decided is we decided we would go in the other way. We made tiny cuts on the chest wall and uh, did not cut any muscle. And then we docked in a robot. And then having docked in the robot, we then dissected the whole tissue of the chest wall. Uh, and, um, you know, we could see the, it was a clean chest. So we could see the second rib very, very clearly. And we, we identified the second rib and using a hook diathermy, I dissected the whole rib off uh, with, with diathermy. And then the thing was, how do you cut the rib? At that stage, I did not have uh, this instrument called a sophomore, which is a large endoscopic rib cutter. So what I did was I took a giggly saw and I passed it through one of the ports and I threaded it around the rib. And so once I had threaded the giggly saw around the rib, I bought it out through one of the ports and I put in a, a syringe at the port to protect the port. Uh, you know, I just protected the port so that there is no damage to the chest wall. And then my assistant just went to and fro and cut the rib using the giggly saw. And so once he had cut the rib, uh, it, was, it, it just fell apart. So we did it on one side and then we went in onto the other side. And then once we had cut the rib on the two sides, we managed to get the whole tumor out. Uh, so let me just speed this up. So this is the tumor. 
the whole tumor is coming out and uh, the robot is actually allowing me to dissect beyond the tumor. The bending of that uh, thing, the ability to bend beyond the tumor is pulling the whole tumor out of the chest wall. And uh, we could very safely put it into a bag and deliver the whole tumor out. And this turned out to be a benign, uh, benign uh, chondro chondroma or something like that. Now the important thing for me is that in this patient, we, this patient managed to rejoin the Indian Navy, he passed his medical, and he rejoined the Indian Navy. And he met me a few years later when he was actually uh, posted on, an in, on, on a ship. So, you know, thinking alternatively, we managed to save the career of this young child, uh, 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 of this young boy, and managed to contribute to, to the army. So it, it is really important to think different. Whenever you're faced with a problem, it's important to think different. Now look at how you can very easily suture the diaphragm. So I delivered the needle through the skin into the chest. So no port for the needle to come in. Look here, the needle is coming through the chest wall. And I'm very nicely and happily uh, lifting the diaphragm and suturing the diaphragm. So it's, it's, it's really a piece of cake to do a a diaphragmatic plication with, with uh, the robot. It is so easy. Uh, it's just amazing how good a feel you get. And, and then you can do multiple layers of suturing and bring it all up. Of course, the only problem is you got to be very careful that you're not taking a deep pipe because that will then, uh, you can take the stomach on the other side because you don't have a sense of feel. So that is something that you've got to be careful about. And then, uh, you know, you tie knots exactly as you would tie in an open surgery. And then you fix the knots. This is something I learned from the urologist. that you put in a Liger clip uh, at the end of your knots. So these knots will not slip. So watch that last knot. And I'm putting in a Liger clip at the end of it to fix the knot into place. And so that way you can do multiple layers. So once you've done. So in this particular patient, I did probably a circular plication. But I do horizontal plications as well. It completely depends on what is the anatomy in the chest that is there at the moment. So it, it, it's really nice to do this operation and it gives you excellent results. Uh, and you can do multiple levels and get a very nice tight diaphragm uh, through this. Uh, this is a, a 26 year old lady who presented with uh, hydropneumothorax when she had a baby. So this uh, the history was two, two months history of delivery of a baby. And uh, she developed a uh, right-sided effusion and they put in a chest drain and it turned out to be a chylothorax. Uh, the chylothorax was probably secondary due to a thrombus in the left IJV. So she had a left IJV thrombus, secondary to which the chylothorax was there bilateral and not resolving. And she was eight, uh, two months in a hospital, eight weeks in a hospital uh, with uh, chest drains and unable to feed her baby. A baby was, uh, you know, a young baby, and she was not able to feed the baby. So we, uh, when the referent came to us, we said the best way is to just get into the chest on the right side, do a ligation of the thoracic duct on the right side, do a pleurectomy, and do a left-sided talc pleurodesis. And so this is what we did. We went in with the robot. The robot has to be docked uh, the same way as you would do for uh, any other surgery, except the orientation is the pelvic orientation, because now you're looking down rather than looking up. So you just have to split the orientation. And I do uh, what is called as uh, a mass ligation. So I also put in an NG tube and give, uh, give uh, uh, what do you call it, um, cream through the NG uh, about half an hour before I start scrubbing. So once the patient is induced and things, I give, and, and in the cream, I put in some methylene blue. So methylene blue, a gentian violet. So the methylene blue and the gentian violet uh, lights up the thoracic duct. And you can see it clearly under vision. And then you go in and you dissect it out and you apply Liger clips and uh, you cut it off. I normally disconnect all my uh, thoracic duct ligations. I try not to keep them connected. I, I just cut across it and disconnect it. And then you carry on and do a pleurectomy. So this is me using the robot to do a pleurectomy and completely dissect the pleura out on that side. Uh, uh, probably done an apical pleurectomy and a left-sided dissect. And really within three or four days, this patient got discharged. 
uh, the lung re-expanded. There was no more collection of uh, of chyles. He was started on anticoagulation for the IJV thrombus, and uh, within four days he went back to her baby. So again, thinking differently helps you with these things. Now, robotic surgery is not without its complications. Uh, I showed you one case of intraoperative bleeding. It when it happens, it can happen really, really seriously. And undocking the robot is a is is a protocol that you must must practice and uh, i will share the protocol with you guys to how what is the protocol for undocking a robot i haven't put it in these slides i had one case which is really interesting um, whenever we do robotics uh, at medalta when we do robotics we use the encephalators and the encephalators are usually gi encephalators the gastro the laparoscopy encephalator for co2 now, what I did not know at the time was that these insufflators have a default setting of 16 to 20 uh, uh, liters uh, flow. When I do thoracic surgery and when I put in CO2 into the chest, I will flow the CO2 only at a rate of six liters, four to six liters, and a pressure of four to six liters, because I don't want uh, a tension pneumothorax. So I am very aggressive with putting the flow down and the pressure down. What happened in this case was that uh, the electricity in the whole building went off and restarted onto generator. So it was a split second change of the power supply. We have a UPS, uninterrupted power supply, but that split second switch over from central electric electricity to the UPS, caused the insufflator to go back to default setting and i just continued operating not realizing that the insufflator was blowing co2 at the rate of 16 liters per minute and suddenly the blood pressure started to fall the uh, the patient uh, just the anesthetist looked up and said everything was going smoothly we were doing i think a thymectomy and everything was going smoothly and suddenly the anesthetist said patient arresting something is wrong just look at it so the first thing I, I realized what was happening luckily i realized what was happening and i asked the assistant to open the ports and the moment he opened the ports and let go all of the co2 we got some sort of control and then i quickly scrubbed in uh, and and by the time we could solve it the patient had dipped quite dramatically so i just opened the chest i made a small mini thoracotomy and released everything out and the moment we released out, we realized that this was a tension pneumothorax, secondary to default setting on a CO2 insufflator. And so the ability to undock the robot was very, very important to save the patient's life in this situation. So it's very, very, very important to understand. And then we had a few cases where the arms were not properly placed or the robot was not, uh, the ports were not properly placed. And as a result of excessive movement of the arms, we ended up bruising the arm or the chest wall, uh, and these things have been reported uh, in literature. Uh, so we've had to convert uh, for a few for bleeding, for tension pneumothorax, and uh, bruising of the arms. This loss of power thing is a very interesting case where we had uh, what happened was uh, we were uh, doing. Uh, I, I again think it must be a time I don't remember what it was. And we had docked the robot in the patient. We just put in the robot, and suddenly the entire power in the theater went off. There was some major short circuit, and the entire theater became black. And the robot, when the power goes off, it freezes. So the anesthetist, even the ventilator went off. So what the anesthetist did was she took over from the ventilator to hand pumping so she was hand pumping a second uh, guy was holding a, a light a torch a big torch we didn't know what the hell was going on and the robot had frozen into the patient but luckily i was not holding any any organ inside the chest i had just docked it in so arms were in the chest but frozen so you cannot undock the arms the arms are frozen inside the chest so what we did was we took the bed down 
So we left everything as it is and using the hand operated crank, we pulled the patient out of the robot rather than the robot out of the patient. And having pulled the patient out of the robot, hand ventilating the patient, we put it on a trolley and went to the next theater, which was working, uh, thank God. And then we set up everything by VATS and we finished the case by VATS. So funny things happen and you got to think on the spot and uh, you have to save the patient's life because here, if the robot is frozen, there is no other way to do it, to get the patient off the robot. So we had to pull the patient out. So what is next with robotic thoracic surgery? Um, I think uniportal robot is already here. The SP robot, a single port robot is uh, being tested. Uh, it has been used very well in abdomen. It works very well with the abdomen. The problem with the chest is that it is still a, a large size. The diameter of the SP robot is still a large size. So this diameter uh, still cannot accommodate the intercostal space. So that is the struggle that we have with the uniportal SP robot. So until and unless they reduce the diameter of all these instruments, uh, you know, it's going to be slightly difficult for SP to become a very popular uh, tool in robotic surgery. So I do two types of uh, uniportal robotic surgery. One is sub z thymectomy, where you air dog the robot. So you make a single incision and all the ports going through the same hole. So it is called an air docking through a single port. So your ports are your ports are outside. Your instrument just enter in through the uh, single incision on the chest wall. <laughs> Uh, we've also done a, a first rib resection through the axillary approach by air docking through a single. So we made an incision in the axilla and dissected across the chest wall into the uh, top of the chest wall. And the robot was outside. The instruments were just going through the uh, incision and we were lifting it up in the air. And uh, we tried to do the first rib resection. Now, there are new robots coming in, which are called as hybrid robots. Uh, these are newer designs, which may hit the market in some time. Uh, these are compatible with laparoscopic uh, instruments. So, they, so using a robotic platform, you can use some of your laparoscopic instruments on these things. And they are also compatible with uh, the routine staplers that you're using. And these designs are still uh, on, the, on the table. Now, I cannot show you any of these pictures because I have signed non-disclosures with all these companies. I'm involved with a lot of development of these instruments, uh, but because this is all uh, very secretive and very sensitive, I'm not allowed to show any pictures uh, in any presentation, at least not as yet. So these are all things that we're doing. Fluorescence robotic surgery is here. Fluorescence robotic surgery is using the ICG. So you give an injection of ICG and then you use a laser line and when you use a laser light, the laser light lights up the blood supply. So it works very well for something like the esophagus, where if you want to dissect the esophageal, uh, the, the gastric tube, uh, using the ICG, you can very easily highlight the, uh, the, the vascularity of the stomach. Uh, you can also use it for segmentectomies, where you highlight the vascularity of the segment, or you can use it to highlight the tumor. So this is where we are doing a, nodular resection of the tumor and the tumor is highlighted by the ICG as opposed to the rest of the lung. And so this is a technology that you can use. This technology was always, always, always designed to be Wi-Fi. It was designed, the original idea of doing robotic surgery was by NASA for space. So when their astronauts went to space and if they had a, say acute appendicitis, you would not have the time to bring the, uh, astronaut down to earth. So sitting down in Chicago or in Houston, wherever their center is, they could actually control the robot in space to do the surgery. So this is the uh, really intercity or international robotic surgery is there. It's already been done. The patient was on the east coast of the of US. The surgeon was on the west coast. In Europe, the patient was in uh, Germany. The surgeon was in Switzerland. So all of this is always designed for uh, wireless technology. But what you need is something called as <coughs> Internet 2. Uh, most of you may not even be aware of the existence of Internet 2. Internet 2 is a, is a, 
is is a broadband is is an internet system which is used by the military okay this is not your standard internet that is available uh, all wireless robotic surgery works on the internet 2 platform which is 56000 times faster than the current internet so most of the military uh, use these uh, internet i mean you, you might be aware that internet started as a military technology it's called as darpa d a r p a and that was the first uh, technology which from which internet originated but the governments uh, of the world have something called as internet 2 which is 56000 times faster and whenever we have to do a wireless transatlantic or trans uh, city uh, robotic surgery we have to get access to internet 2 so that all your images are transferred in real time you cannot have a time lag when you're doing uh, uh, when you're doing an international uh, wireless robotic surgery so the reality is that this technology has left the station okay no longer are we asking you you know whether do we need to do it or do we not to need to do it this has already this train has left the station we are already there is going to go is going to go with you or without you that's it we are no longer we don't need you the question is do you need us you know are you do you choose to be on it or do you choose to be left behind i no longer do presentations where i have to convince the people that robotic surgery should be done uh, there are many 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 skeptics and we don't worry about them we just ignore them we ignore the skeptics and we just get on with life and we do what we have to i've shown you this uh, with these images before but i'm again put it into the robotic platform it's very important when you want to fly high like an eagle when you want to achieve success at the highest level it is absolutely mandatory to not hang around with the turkeys there are people around the world who will tell you every single reason why you cannot succeed you know they are your neighbor your boss your uh, you know next hospital guy this that there are hundreds of people who will discourage you at every stage of life when you want to succeed all these people will tell you every single reason why you cannot succeed but you must choose to fly high you have to just change your friends you know run away from people who talk rubbish about these things uh, when i came from the uk i had a very comfortable life in the uk i was you know monday to friday working uh, saturday sunday off uh, living in a really nice house there was a spa in the house there was a everything it was all comfortable but i chose to come to india because i thought it will be a great journey and really that one decision of moving from uk to india changed my life completely and that decision to make the journey on a path less traveled is what made all the difference so i must be most people go from india abroad to get fame and success i must be the only guy who came from abroad to india to get fame and success so for me really the reverse migration worked very well to get my hands onto the robotic technology and I, and i owe everything to india i owe it to india for giving me this uh, technology for giving me access and dr naresh trian who who was a visionary who is a visionary and i was lucky to actually get on the same platform as him and that one single decision made made a whole difference so you know there are enough people around who will say that you cannot do this but the ones who changed the world they are the ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are usually the ones who do change the world so it's an 80 20 pareto's phenomenon it's called as pareto's theorem 80 people of the world do nothing but they say you cannot do anything and 20 of the percent of the people who do everything are the ones who say they do everything so it's an 80 20 uh, philosophy in life so you can choose to be either the 20 or you can choose to be the 80 it doesn't matter uh, my life is my life i'm very happy with it uh, you are the young guys you are the ones who have to choose whether you want to change your methodology or not at the end of the day i said right at the start of my talk that robotics is just a tool it is a tool that you have in your armamentarium and you choose selectively what works for what patients whether you want to do multiport wires uniport wires robotics single port robotics whatever you want to do choose your tool carefully but important is do not compromise the surgery you cannot compromise the quality of the surgery 
for the access. And that is the message I want you to take home with you at the end of this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Zameer. It's an excellent as usual. Thank you, Sri Krishna. I just have one question. Okay, I'm just going to increase the volume, Sri Krishna. One second, I have lowered my volume because of the sound. Yeah, tell me. Have you ever used, I think it's called flex tech or something, you know? The yeah, I have. Endo risk uh, technology for VAX. Yeah, flex tech. See, one of the problems with uh, robotics is that it is a big platform. You know, it's very cumbersome. To, to dock a robot is extremely cumbersome. So there is a new technology which is coming, which is called as flex tech uh, technology, which is handheld robots. So I, I, I don't know why that slide was not there in this talk. Maybe I picked up a different uh, talk, but it is there in my talks. In, in some talk, I have definitely spoken about flex tech. So these are handheld robots. So you hold it in your hand, you go onto the bedside of the patient, you operate, but the movements you get are exactly like with a robot. So it's a new technology. It's, it's nice, uh, but obviously the vision is not the same. You see, the camera is not robotic. The flex text is robotic. So yeah, the, no, the, the vision is not there, but, but the movement is there with flex text. So it is good. It's good. Okay. It's, it's use of uh, endo risk in uh, VATS setting. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. It's a robotic platform in VATS setting. It's a hybrid technology. But the vision is still VATS. Correct. Correct. Okay. Who else wants to come on? There was but, some uh, question. But then your tactile sen uh, sensation will be better. It's maintained, yeah. The tactile sensation is maintained with flex text. There are a lot of... I, I Actually, I don't know why I, I didn't look through the whole talk, but there is... I haven't spoken about endoscopic robots. Uh, I have a huge talk on endoscopic robots. Uh, probably it is there in one of my other talks. So we do... Uh, endo-oral uh, robots and uh, endobronchial lobectomies and things like that. All that is still there. Those are all new technologies which are being developed. Uh, I'm involved with some of them uh, in, in developing the endo-oral uh, robots. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sri Krishna. You stayed up very late. <laughs> yeah. No, it's nice. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody wants to ask? Uh, Vikas, you're there. Now, can you just take these questions? I, I don't know what's happening. What are these questions? Yes, sir. Uh, may I be asking, sir, when do you remove drain if you have done extensive mediastinal node dissection for lung or esophageal carcinoma robotically? Day one. Concept Excellent. still same or do we wait a little longer? No, day one. <clears throat> day one. Uh, you have to read the Copenhagen experience, okay? Uh, please go online. E, uh, it's in European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery. Uh, the Copenhagen experience from uh, I forget the name of the guy. Rene Patterson. Uh, Rene no, Patterson. No, it's not Peterson. Somebody else's paper. I'll, I'll I'll get you the paper. It is there in my collection. I'll send it to you. Uh, amount of fluid that comes out is makes no difference to removal of the drain. That's the most important message. So. They take out at 600, 700. I have a cutoff of 300, 400. But fluid no longer matters to me. I take out the drain. The presence of a drain acts as a foreign material and uh, inculcates uh, fluid to be formed or inflammation to happen. So I, I don't, uh, it makes no difference. If I've done it, only infective cases, I will leave it longer. Whenever there is infection, I leave it longer. Otherwise, I just take the drain. In clean surgery, there is no indication for it. Yeah, Vikas, come on. Next question is, in esophageal malignancies, do you keep, keep the drain till you do a contrast study or you remove yes. it? Yes, yes, yes. In esophagus, you usually keep it till the contrast. Day five, day five or day six. I, 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 am, I was trained by Joe Rahman and uh, David Beaton uh, in esophageal surgery. And so that is the principle that we still follow. But now I don't do much esophagus because when I came to Medanta, uh, uh, Dr. Chowdhury was already uh, well established in esophageal surgery, so I never treaded on his foot. I didn't want to create a, you know any uh, bad feelings, so I almost uh, stayed away from esophagus. But in my own practice for benign esophagus, uh, I still do a lot of benign esophagus. But uh, malignancies of esophagus has almost gone to upper GI now. Thank you, sir. Sir, another small question I have. This is yeah. Dr. Priya here. Yeah. Uh, 
on what day do you do a contrast study routinely after your esophageal Five. malignancy? Day 5. Day 5. Okay, fine. Great. Thank you, sir. Next question is, during port placement, do we follow 9 centimeter rule or modify according to BMI or local topography? No, usually for the SI, the, in a standard patient, you, you follow a 9 centimeter rule. In an XI, you don't follow the 9 centimeter rule. You reduce that to 7 centimeters. And in a fat patient, you, you can increase because the problem with Indian patients is it's a very narrow chest. And to put in four port, there is not enough space. You know, you calculate nine by nine across from the sternum, sternal edge to the back of the vertebra. There is 32 centimeters are not there. <laughs> you know, uh, whatever nine fours are, is what 36. 36 centimeters, you don't get that distance. And uh, the la and the lateral three centimeters next to the vertebral column, you don't want to put in a port because that is a very narrow space. So that is called as a, a no-fly zone. So you have to leave three centimeters next to the vertebral column. So there's not enough play, uh, space in an Indian chest. Uh, so, but if it's a fat person, you have more space. So you can then uh, increase your uh, distance. But in an SI, more the distance better. In an XI, it doesn't matter. XI is very accommodative. It's a slimmer profile. So the clashing does not happen. The reason why you keep this nine centimeter is because you don't want the arms to clash. Uh, and uh, once it starts to clash, it's very, very troublesome. Uh, to yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bhushan, you were saying something? Uh, here, I, uh, Dr. Surandar Patel here, sir. Uh, uh, I want to ask one question, sir. Uh, I am doing open thoracic surgery, all types of, and I want to just start uh, robotic. And uh, at all, at uh, I am at All India Institute of Medical Science, assistant professor in Jodhpur, and we have a robotic system. But our urologic colleague and GI surgery colleagues are doing. The, how can I start there, sir? Can I have to take some training sessions, and from where, uh, where I can get to train, sir? Okay. So the legal requirement training, now with with yes. uh, Intuitive, the legal requirement is that there are three levels of training that you have to do. Okay. First is uh, training for the instruments, uh, training for the doc. It's called as console time training. That console time training can be done on your console. Uh, every console that you have in a hospital has, uh, has modules for training. So the first uh, 20 hours or 25 hours you have to do on the console in your hospital. And that uh, training can be done uh, in the evenings or uh, on a weekend on your local hospital. You have to get permission from whoever is your robotic director. The second is uh, basic level training with intuitive. So you need to get an intuitive certification for uh, using the robot. And that I believe in India used to be in Kochi. I think that's moved now. Uh, I am not sure where it is now, but if you contact your intuitive representative, they will, uh, they will uh, do that for you. Now, there are two or three ways uh, that uh, coaching is done. It costs money. It costs about 1 to 1.5 lakhs, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but uh, whenever Intuitive uh, installs a robot, it always gives certain free slots for the hospital. So if your hospital has got any of those slots available, then use them. If they haven't got the slot available, then you'll have to pay for it or you will have to get some company to sponsor you. So that's the second. And then the third one is all advanced training. So you have to do, uh, you have to visit, uh, you cannot start your program straight away. Uh, once you've done the robotic certification with Intuitive, then Intuitive will appoint uh, a perceptor for you. It's called as a perceptor uh, model, uh, where the perceptor will come to you and he will sit with you while you're doing your first case. And there are a certain number of hours that you have to do with the perceptor on site. And then the perceptor has to assess you and sign you off because there's a medical legal issue with this. So companies are now getting more and more uh, careful about who sits on the robot. Because if you're not trained and you create an accidental injury, then the company gets a bad name. That's why they are becoming very strict about this. When I started doing robotics, no, there was no training. And there was no center which was doing this. So we learned on the robot and we got local certifications on the robot. We did hours on the robot. But now it is very, very strict. The medical legal uh, situation is very strict. So you have to go through the intuitive platform. 
speak to your intuitive rep he will guide you through the whole platform it does cost okay. money it does okay. cost money So, uh, okay, for the second you. step there is huge criteria sir they don't accept any uh, person uh, uh, even for the second step you have to show that you are doing monthly at least minimum 20 to 30 cases of only lobectomies is what their criteria is uh, this is the intuitive criteria yeah, i don't know what it is yeah this, this i mean the, even the second step is not very easy because i've actually cleared the first step it's it's not that it's not very easy it is it is actually doable everybody all all my juniors have done it and uh, my yeah, registrars UK. are all going on to the yeah in uk my registrars okay. are going on to the course and uh, it's 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 not difficult i promise you it's not difficult and no, it's not that you have to it 20 30, it's not that you have to do 20 30 cases or whatever i don't mm-hmm. think that is correct uh, because the whole idea is to encourage people to do robotic surgery but uh, you have to start doing it step wise small fish first mid intermediate fish next and large fish after that so it, it is it i i don't think that is that is the our registrar I'm, I'm just telling about the india experience that even right. in india actually i i i am in the process of putting some people through robotic training and uh, i i don't think that is the criteria the point is you cannot do 30 lobectomies and then go for training exactly it's the very the bottom difficult. line is you can, no 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 so that is incorrect what you're saying is incorrect i don't think that is that is the criteria uh the criteria is that you you need to have done all these things before and uh, then uh, then you can do a lobectomy so that is not the criteria i'm pretty certain about it uh, my registrars here have done it and in india we are trying to send some people for training so i don't think that's the criteria okay then that is good actually it's a good news yeah. who's next any other questions no questions on the chat sir okay all right good so we are doing well what's the time 7:30 one bye let me stop recording